Now this is one of those totally crazy cases that no matter how hard you look at it, you just don't understand why it happened. Philip Cheesum seemed like a nice, shy, and well-behaved boy who would never hurt anyone. But then one day, he did something that left everybody completely horrified. Colleen Ritzer was born on May 13, 1989 in Lawrence, Massachusetts to her parents, Peggy and Thomas. She was the eldest of three children and was really close to her brother and sister. Colleen grew up in Danvers, and from as young as three years old, she knew that she wanted to be a teacher, just like her favorite preschool teacher. Her interest continued to grow throughout elementary and high school, but it was during her senior year at Assumption College in 2011 that she realized that teaching was not just a career for her, but a calling. After graduation, Colleen got a job as a math teacher at Danvers High School in 2012, where she was described as a dedicated teacher who was always there for her students. She had the ability to know every student's strengths and challenges and would come up with fun ways to make learning interesting. She would even stay after school to help those students that were struggling in class. Looking at her Twitter page, you can tell that she was one of those people who actually loved their job. Her bio reads, Math teacher, often too excited about the topics I'm teaching. Apart from teaching, Colleen also loved spending time with her family and friends. And she was always there for everyone, whether it's cheering her sister on at hockey games, playing at a family gathering, or going on a road trip with friends. Colleen was always there with her ever-present smile. She made people feel loved and appreciated, and everyone really liked her. On October 22nd, 2013, Colleen was at work doing what she loved most. At around 2.30 p.m., she asked a couple of students in her ninth grade class to remain behind so that she could help them with some math problems that they were struggling with. At 2.54 p.m., Colleen was captured on the school's CCTV camera, leaving the classroom and walking towards the women's restroom. That was the last time she would ever be seen alive again. When the school closed a few hours later, Colleen's parents started getting worried when she never came home. They tried calling her, but her phone was not going through. They called all her friends to ask if they knew where she was, but no one did. Concerned that something might have happened to her, Colleen's dad went over to the school and was shocked to find that her car was still there, but Colleen was nowhere to be found. Around this time, another parent was getting desperately worried because her 14-year-old son, Philip Cheesum, didn't come home. Philip was a quiet and shy boy who had only been in the school for about two months. He and his mom and his siblings had moved from Tennessee after his parents' divorce, and he was going through a really tough time. He didn't understand why he had to move to a new town away from his friends and felt like his life had been turned upside down. He hated his new school, and apart from playing soccer, he mostly kept to himself. When he didn't come home from school that day, his mom, Diana, got worried and called the police and reported him missing. The search was launched at around 9 p.m., and the school principal sent out an email to the staff reporting that a student was missing. Shortly after sending the email, the principal received a call from another teacher telling her that Colleen was also missing. The teacher also mentioned that Philip was one of the two students Colleen was giving extra help to after class. The fact that the two were last seen together and went missing at the same time raised a lot of questions. Like, did they go missing together? Were they kidnapped? What could have happened to them? Since Philip was a minor, the police decided to focus on his case first. A parent of another student came forward and said that they had seen Philip running away from the school at around 3.30 p.m. When police pinged his phone, they learned that he had gone to watch a Woody Allen movie at a local theater at around 4.30 p.m. before leaving. Did he run away? The next day, a Danvers police officer decided to go over to the school and review surveillance footage from the cameras around the school. And what he found was something that he would never have expected. When Colleen went to the bathroom at 2.54 p.m. that day, a minute later, the CCTV camera captured someone wearing a hood and gloves following her into the bathroom. At 3.06, a girl enters the same bathroom but quickly walks out. She later told investigators that she saw the back of a person who appeared to be changing clothes. A minute later, the person who had followed Colleen into the bathroom comes out, and during the next several minutes, he walks in and out of the school building, changing his clothes, putting on a black mask, 
and drags a recycling bin into the bathroom. At 3.22 p.m., the person with the ski mask leaves the bathroom, pulling the recycling bin to the elevator, then out of the building and toward the student parking lot. On October 23rd, at 12.30 p.m., an officer in a nearby town saw a teenage boy walking on a highway carrying a backpack. The boy turned out to be Philip Chisholm, and when the officer checked his backpack, he was shocked by what he found. Philip had a knife and a red-stained box cutter, and when he asked where the blood came from, he replied, the girl. The officer also found credit cards and a driver's license that belonged to Colleen, as well as a pair of women's underwear in his backpack. At first, Philip claimed that he found the items at a gas station, but later said that he took them out of Colleen's car. Philip was immediately arrested and taken in for questioning. Colleen's body was found in the woods near the school, covered with leaves and debris. She was naked from the waist down and had multiple wounds. The police also found the recycling bin from surveillance footage nearby, as well as clothes and soaked gloves. In the back of this Danvers police cruiser sits the 14-year-old boy accused of killing a popular Danvers high school teacher. This morning, he was driven from police headquarters to court in Salem to be arraigned for murder. Near Colleen's body, there was a handwritten note that read, I hate you all. When the news got out of what happened, everyone was completely horrified because they could not have imagined that a student who had never been aggressive or showed any signs of being troubled before could do such a horrifying thing to his teacher. Colleen was loved by most of her students, so why would Philip do that to her? Then I was like really shocked that it was him. Like I like wouldn't suspect it at all. I was like, like people say it's always the quiet ones though, so like maybe that's why like it like, could have been like if he had like troubles at home or something but he was nice so I didn't like suspect it that Philip's mother was also shaken and didn't know how to explain her son's behavior other than the stressful divorce. She thought that it might have affected her son in ways that she could never have imagined. Investigators talked to the other student who had been with Philip in class that day. She said that Colleen had asked Philip about his old hometown, Clarksville, Tennessee, and that Philip became visibly upset. At first, Colleen did not notice that Philip was upset, and when she did, she changed the subject. But according to the student, Philip started talking to himself. Could this have been the motive? During his interrogation, Philip allegedly told investigators that Colleen set him off with a trigger word, which he did not disclose, saying, and I quote, after she insulted me, that's when I became the teacher. This made it look like it was a crime of passion. Like he didn't plan for everything to happen as it did, but from what you can see from the video footage, this is not true. Philip came to school that day, prepared to take Colleen's life. He carried a knife, a box cutter, a mask, a pair of gloves, and several change of clothes. This means that he had planned everything beforehand and he knew exactly what he was doing. And because of this, he was charged with first degree homicide, armed robbery, among other charges. He pleaded not guilty and was held without bail at a detention center to await trial. But get this, even before his trial started, Philip got himself in trouble again when he allegedly attacked a female guard in almost the exact same way he did Colleen. He followed the woman into a locker room making sure that he was not being watched, and then pushed her against the wall and started attacking her using a pencil. How insane is that? At the detention center, sources say surveillance video shows Chisholm following a female worker into a staff locker room, carrying what appears to be a pencil. The woman says Chisholm came at her and began shitting her. As she screamed for help, he started punching her. Within seconds, staff members rushed in to help and restrain Chisholm. She was not seriously injured. The woman suffered injuries to her face, neck, and back, but fortunately she was saved before anything serious happened. Philip's trial started in 2015 and due to the horrific nature of his crimes, he was tried as an adult. His defense claimed that Philip was suffering from severe mental illnesses and was not criminally responsible for his actions. They brought in a psychiatrist who testified that Philip had suffered from a psychotic disorder since he was young and that he was hearing voices and hallucinating when he killed Colleen. When Philip Chisholm followed Miss Ritzer into that bathroom, he was not himself. He was not the kind, smart 14-year-old boy. He was totally and absolutely responding to the terrible command hallucinations that were in his head. He didn't choose to do this. 
The prosecution, on the other hand, argued that Philip was not mentally ill when he committed the crime, and that the surveillance video from the school showed that he had planned to take Colleen's life. They said that Colleen was likely still alive when Philip dragged her into the woods. I am not gonna stand here and tell you there is nothing wrong with Philip Chisholm. How could I? But I am going to submit that there is overwhelming evidence in this case beyond any reasonable doubt that Philip Chisholm was not <clears throat> suffering from a mental disease or defect on October 22nd of 2013. That Philip Chisholm knew right from wrong and could choose right from wrong. After four weeks of trial and four dozen witnesses taking the stand, Philip was found guilty of all charges. Before his sentencing, Colleen's family and friends gave heartbreaking impact statements saying how her death had affected them. Her dad said that he had felt like he failed his daughter because he could not protect her. And I lost my beautiful little girl. Colleen was my daughter, my friend, someone I could go to for anything. I didn't protect Colleen. My dad's job is to fix things. I would do anything if I could fix this for Colleen. Colleen's mom described her final moments with her daughter and the pain their family had endured living without her. She said that her daughter's death had left her broken and asked the judge to give Philip a sentence, but admitted that that's not an option under Massachusetts law. He is pure evil and evil can never be rehabilitated. You need to consider the safety of our family and the rest of the community as we live in fear if he ever gets out of prison. Colleen and our family will never get a second chance, and neither should he. In the end, the judge sentenced Philip to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years for the murder charge, and 40 years and one day for the other charges. This court will impose the mandatory life sentence for the murder of Colleen Ritzer and set a parole eligibility date of 25 years, the highest level our law allows. This court will impose a concurrent sentence of 40 years to 40 years and one day for the rape of Colleen Ritzer and a concurrent sentence of 40 years to 40 years and one day for the armed robbery. Concurrently, that means that the sentences will be served at the same time, meaning that Philip will be eligible for parole after 40 years. So by the time that he finally gets out, he would be in his 50s. Philip showed no emotion as his sentence was being read, but his mom broke down in tears at the thought that her son will be spending over half his life in prison. She later released a press statement expressing her condolences to Colleen's family saying, words cannot express the amount of pain and sorrow these past two and a half years have been. However, there is no one who has suffered more than the Ritzer family. My utmost esteem, prayers, and humble respect is with them today as they continue their journey to heal. Do you still remember what you were doing at 13 years old? While some of us were worried about school, trying to fit in, and generally just being teenagers, this boy was learning how to kill. Let's check out the life of Craig Price, the 13-year-old serial killer who had a thirst for Craig Chandler Price was born on October 11, 1974 in Warwick, Rhode Island. He was the last born of three children of John and Shirley Price. John worked as a manager at a local department store, while Shirley was a clerk in the same store. Growing up, Craig had a pretty normal childhood with loving parents that worked hard to provide for them. People who knew him described him as a happy child who would go the extra mile to help others. When any of his neighbors needed any help, Craig was always the first to arrive. Whether it was carrying someone's groceries or mowing their lawn, Craig never hesitated to offer his services. At school, Craig was a brilliant student who got good grades and was good at sports. He loved football and basketball and playing his fire red electric guitar. He was a blue jeans and t-shirt kind of kid and was into hard rock and rap music. He was also a storyteller, a mimic, and a natural comedian who had the gift of making people laugh. So what changed? When Craig turned nine, he started experiencing some disturbing thoughts about other people dying. Some people have speculated that these thoughts caused Craig to act out violently with the people around him. He started getting in trouble at home and in school, 
to the point that the police were involved. His erratic behavior worsened with time, and by the time he was 13, he had a long rap sheet that involved breaking and entering, petty theft, stalking, and assault. He had also joined a local gang and was experimenting with illegal substances. He wound up in juvie and was put on probation. Around this period, Craig also experienced a sudden growth spurt, which made him bigger than all the other boys in his neighborhood. People began to notice that the once cute and helpful boy that they had grown to like was now a burly and mean teenager who was always getting in trouble with the authorities. Still, apart from the stalking, he never did anything too serious to indicate what he was about to become. The night of July 27th, 1987 was like any other. Craig's dad left for the night shift, his sister went to stay with a friend, and his mom and brother went to bed early. Craig decided to sneak out and roam around the neighborhood like he usually did. But this time, he had a dark and sinister plan at the back of his mind. As he was sneaking and creeping around people's backyards, he found himself in a three-bedroom ranch just two houses away from his home. The woman who lived there was 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer. She had rented the house with one of her brothers and lived with her two children, an eight-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. Rebecca's lease was about to expire, and she planned to move out of there before the end of the month. That day, she had asked her ex-husband to pick up the kids so that she could have time to pack without any distractions. Rebecca's ex-husband picked up the kids early in the morning, and Rebecca called a friend to come over and help her with packing. After spending the whole day packing, Rebecca made some dinner for her friend and her brother, who left the house around 8.30 p.m. to go to work. The friend was also picked up by her boyfriend around midnight, and Rebecca was left alone in the house. After making sure that all the doors and windows were locked, Rebecca changed into her pajamas, grabbed a blanket, turned on the TV, and laid down on the living room floor. Within a few minutes, she was dead asleep. Craig saw the dim, flickering light from his crouched down position in the backyard. He slowly crept inside the house and found Rebecca sleeping on the living room floor, curled up in the blanket. He went into the kitchen, where he intended to grab a frying pan, but changed his mind once he saw a 10-inch kitchen knife lying on the counter. And then I was like, oh, what the hell? I ran into like, the kitchen. On top of the refrigerator was a knife, and I just, just killed him. Rebecca was still asleep when Craig started attacking her. He punctured her heart, lungs, face, and head a total of 58 times. And when he was done, he simply stood up and calmly left the house. He went out the back door, snuck over her back fence into her neighbor's yard before heading to his own home. He was 13 years old and in seventh grade at this time, and he had just had his first taste of blood. Since Rebecca was still asleep when Craig attacked her, she never got the chance to scream, so no one heard anything. Her brother found her the next morning, lying in a red pool. He called 911 and tried performing CPR on her, but she was already gone. The police came and secured the crime scene, trying to find clues as to who could have committed such a horrific crime. But they couldn't find any evidence, and the case soon went cold. Craig lay low after this attack, and for the next two years, he joined high school and went on with life as if nothing had happened. But then, the thirst of blood returned again when he was 15, and he started looking for his next victim. And unfortunately, it happened to be another woman in the neighborhood by the name of Joan Heaton. Joan had married her high school sweetheart, Sergeant John Heaton, when she was very young. Not long after, they were blessed with their firstborn daughter, Jennifer, and two years later, their other daughter, Melissa, came along. The Heatons seemed to be the perfect family that loved spending time together, sharing laughter, and making beautiful memories. However, on June 19, 1983, tragedy hit the family when John decided to end his own life. After this tragic loss, Joan decided to move to a new town and start a new life with her daughters. She found a nice house in Warwick and thought that it would be ideal for her and her daughters to start over. Sadly, she was mistaken. On the night of September 1st, 1989, 
Craig got really high on various illegal substances and snuck inside Joan's house by cutting a window screen. He went into the kitchen and grabbed a steak knife, which ironically, Joan had bought earlier that day. While he was breaking in, he made some noise that woke Joan up and she went downstairs to investigate as she was terrified when she saw this huge shadow in the kitchen. She didn't say anything. She was just like trying to, like, as soon as she seen me, like, like run the other way, break the other way. Okay. And I grabbed her. What happened then? I was just, like, trying to kill her. Joan tried to fight back, but Craig was far too big for her, and he managed to overpower her. Hey, you can see the mark right there. She bit me there, and I bit her back. He grabbed a knife and viciously thrust it all over her body, inflicting a total of 57 wounds. During the struggle, Joan's daughters woke up and came downstairs to check what was happening. They stared in horror as the teenager viciously attacked their mother. Craig saw Jennifer first and he lunged at her, grabbed her and started attacking. Jennifer screamed and asked eight-year-old Melissa, to call 911. Get to the phone, get to the phone. She was just saying that, get to the phone. She didn't say in the name, but she said. Craig s***ed Jennifer 62 times before he noticed Melissa heading for the phone. He managed to reach her before she could grab the phone and wounded her 37 times before crushing her skull with a nearby stool. The attack on Melissa was so vicious that the tip of the knife snapped off inside of her. After he was done, he stood up and saw the damage he had done, and for some reason, decided to cover the two bodies. He then gathered everything that could lead the police to him and calmly walked out the back door and into the night. The next day, Joan's family got worried when they couldn't get through to her phone, so they decided to drive over to the house and check on her, and when they got there, they were completely horrified by what they found. A detective who was among the first to arrive at the scene later said, the bodies had been covered with a blanket, maybe two blankets and a rug. Underneath the blanket were these three bodies that were absolutely destroyed. The perpetrator that day to us was unbelievable. Fear had also started to spread throughout the once safe neighborhood, with people referring to the perpetrator as the Warwick Slasher. They locked themselves in their houses and put up state-of-the-art security systems around their homes to protect themselves from the psychotic Now, when Rebecca was attacked, authorities assumed that the murderer was someone she knew, since no other attack followed after that. But then, after what happened to Joan and her daughter, detectives had no doubt that they were dealing with a serial killer. Several things about the attacks led to this conclusion. First, both Rebecca and Joan were single mothers with two children. Then each woman was viciously stabbed around the same number of times. Rebecca had 58 wounds while Joan had 57. The stab patterns on both women were also nearly identical. However, in both cases, investigators could not find the knives used in the attack and also could not tell what the killer's motive was. But they did find a footprint that belonged to a man-sized 13 socked foot. Since no one in the house wore that size, they concluded it had to be the attacker. The investigators called in an FBI profiler who was determined that there was a frantic nature to the attack, which meant that the suspect demonstrated sheer anger and rage. Knowing this, the profiler told detectives that the suspect must have cut himself with the same blade that broke off in Melissa's neck. He advised investigators to look for someone wearing a bandage on his arm or hand. One day, a couple of officers were patrolling the neighborhood when they spotted Craig hanging out with his friends at a local park. They already knew him from his previous run-ins with authorities, and he was also a regular participant in local police-sponsored youth events. When officers saw him, they decided to see if he had any information about what was happening in the area. Craig was not a suspect, they just knew that he was familiar with the streets and therefore could have heard something about who could have committed the crimes. As the officers approached him, they quickly noticed the bandage on his hand. They asked him what had happened and he said that he had got hurt after punching a car window. But when the officers checked into his story, they found that there was no report of a vandalized car. They also could not find any signs of a car window being smashed around the streets which could only mean that Craig had lied. 
Around this time, one of Craig's friends called the officers and told them that Craig had been bragging about murdering Rebecca and getting away with it. This information led investigators to get a search warrant that allowed them to search Craig's house. And when they did, they found a plastic bag hidden in a shed outside the house. And inside it were blood-soaked items that include knives, clothes, gloves, and some other random things. But it was the blood-soaked sock that matched the footprint at the crime scene, which led detectives to believe they'd found the man they were looking for. Craig was immediately arrested, much to the shock of his family, who could not believe the son they knew and loved was actually a cold-blooded killer. When Craig was being interrogated, the detective started by asking him why he was so angry all the time, and he would eventually imply that it was because of racism, saying that it was what eventually caused him to do what he did. He told detectives that one day as he was playing in the streets with his friends, a man called him the N-word and some other derogatory slurs while screaming at them to get out of the road. Craig said how this man's actions made him angry and he swore to get revenge. So he spent the next couple of days watching the man drive by the street and saw him pull in and out of Rebecca's driveway. Apparently the man was Rebecca's brother. Carl. When police questioned Carl about this, he admitted seeing the boys in the street but denied ever screaming at them or using derogatory slurs. After telling detectives about his anger towards Carl, Craig went on to confess everything that he did to Rebecca and later did to Joan and her children, saying that he had to use six knives on them. If you can remember, how many knives did you use? Mm, a lot. About six, I think, maybe. One of the detectives who arrested Craig later said that Craig was talking in a cool and calm manner and acting like what he did was nothing. And he's talking like he these people, like it was nothing. I mean, like absolutely nothing. It's, just, it's incredible. Finally, Craig was charged with four counts of first-degree homicide and two counts of burglary. When he was arrested, he was just a month away from his 16th birthday, meaning that under the Rhode Island law at the time, he could only be jailed up to his 21st birthday. This meant that despite the brutality of his crimes, he would only serve five to six years in juvie and then be released and his criminal record sealed. Imagine that. To say people were outraged by this was an understatement. They could not believe that Craig would get away with a mere slap on the wrist after committing such horrific crimes. And Craig was not helping matters either. He refused to go through psychological therapy and examination to determine how he should be rehabilitated. One psychiatrist appointed by the family court to review the case had noted, I suspect from all that I have seen and know of these murders, that Craig was in a psychotic rage at the time of these events, and that he should probably be classified as a serial murderer, disorganized type. He recommended that Craig undergoes psychiatric treatment before being released back into society, saying that if he's not treated, he might go back to killing people when he's released. However, Craig, on the advice of his attorney, refused to participate in any mental assessment, therefore remained untreated. His lawyer's concern was that if Craig allowed the assessment and the psychiatrist found issues, he would be placed in a psychiatric facility where he would be held past his 21st birthday. In 1990, the community of Rhode Island managed to pass a law that would harden sentencing for juvenile offenders. Unfortunately, their efforts would still not be enough to keep Craig in jail past his 21st birthday. But everyone was afraid of Craig being released and coming back to finish what he started. His behavior in jail made him remain locked up. Before his 21st birthday, he was charged with contempt of court for refusing to undergo court-ordered psychological testing. And while in court facing the contempt charges, he totally lashed out at a correctional officer and threatened to kill him. Given that he was already a convicted murderer, he was found guilty of contempt and sentenced to serve an additional 15 years with eight suspended. Craig's violent behavior continued to escalate even while in prison, and the court continued to add more and more years to his sentence. In 1996, he received an additional year for biting a finger of an officer. And a year after that, he was charged in contempt again for refusing psychological evaluation and given additional 25 years, 15 suspended. Around 1999 and 2001, he allegedly verbally and physically attacked another officer and received four 
additional years. In 2017, he was accused of attacking a fellow inmate with a weapon and received 25 additional years. Before the incident in 2017, his earliest parole would have been February 2022, but now he's serving 25 more years. Craig, who is currently 48 years old, said in an interview that he believes there's a conspiracy to keep him locked up for life. Maybe he's right. Craig Price will never go away from us for at least a generation because that's, that's unthinkable that a 13-year-old, 13-year-old boy can do that. What defines evil? An absolute lack of empathy towards all living beings? Hatred? Deeply immoral behavior? In some horrifying cases, it's all three. This is the truly tragic case of Maddie Middleton. She was an eight-year-old girl with her whole future ahead of her. She'd never hurt a fly and was as sweet as any girl her age. The end she met at the hands of Adrian Gonzalez is simply chilling. Let's dive into the case of the teen who killed an eight-year-old and then threw her body in a dumpster. Today's story begins in Santa Cruz, in the sunny state of California. Maddie Middleton was born November 2006 to Laura and Mike. When Maddie was kindergarten age, Laura and Mike split up and Maddie stayed with her mom. However, she was very close to her dad too, and the two would do fun activities at least on a weekly basis. Maddie was the sweetest girl you can imagine. She always seemed happy, she loved the beach, the water, and she would always have a joke to tell. She and Laura lived in a newly built loft building called the Tannery Arts Center by the water, which had been made for low-income households and artists in the area. This was a very friendly community, especially encouraging people to interact and collaborate in making artistic projects together. In general, just felt very quiet, serene. It was really beautiful. It um, backs up to the San Lorenzo River. It was a tight-knit community where everyone knew each other and everyone felt safe. Laura was happy to let Maddie play outside with other children unsupervised. Unfortunately, that would soon take a very dark turn. It was Sunday, July 26, 2015. Maddie had been riding her scooter around the Tannery Art Center, just like any other weekend. Around 5 p.m., the CCTV footage showed Maddie playing outside for the last time. Maddie never returned home. Laura quickly entered panic mode. This was unlike her daughter, and she would never go to a friend's place without at least consulting Laura first. At 6.08 p.m., Laura notified the police about her daughter's disappearance. The search for Maddie began immediately, but she was nowhere to be found. When Santa Cruz police say they've expanded their four and a half square mile search area for the missing eight-year-old girl and have called in the FBI who have additional resources to help Search crews in orange jackets are fanning out through a large area of Santa Cruz, hoping to find any sign of Madison Middleton. With neighbors, the local police, and the FBI searching frantically for her daughter, Laura barely felt alive anymore. I already fell apart. Now I'm just in survival mode. I, I can't explain how difficult this is. Nobody should have to go through this. On July 27th, the police were still looking for Maddie and refused to call the search a kidnapping investigation. We're not calling this a kidnapping. We're still early on in our investigation. What we're calling it, this is we're looking for a lost child. The police seemed optimistic, or at least trying to keep the public hopeful. Meanwhile, a boy who lived around the same complex was eager to find out if there were any updates on the case. This was 15-year-old Adrian Gonzalez. Every other hour, he would ask his neighbors if they'd heard anything new or if they'd found Maddie. They kept asking any updates and I was like, we're not getting anywhere, you know, I don't know. All day long, Adrian would play with his yo-yo outside his flat and watch over the neighbors who were searching for Maddie. Every time I spoke to you guys or the police or the FBI, you were like, any updates? And I was like, dude, why do you keep asking me? You're the only one asking me and asking my brother and asking everybody. 
was Monday, the 28th. No one had given up the search, and the Tannery Arts Center community was hopeful Maddie would be found, since the police had expanded their search a lot. But at 7.55 that evening, a police detective had looked inside a recycling dumpster, inside an enclosed parking structure, and inside the dumpster was Maddie's lifeless body. She was just a few yards away from where she lived. I just cannot imagine for those who live there and know the story, they must think this every time they walk by or have to throw their garbage in there. Adrian Gonzalez heard the news immediately. He was standing in the area. The minute he knew, he ran off. This move was obvious enough for the police to go after him. He was arrested on the spot and was taken to the police station. He openly confessed to killing Maddie. As he was taken to the police car, Gonzalez's mom threw a fit in front of the whole community. She didn't believe her son could have done such a thing. The police must be wrong, she said. But as the police took a closer look at Maddie's body, the truth only got darker. She had been killed in the most violent ways. Gonzalez had lured her into his apartment with the promises of ice cream. Then he tied her up with duct tape and abused her in every way possible. When he was done with her, he threw her in the trash. He folded her. That's how they described it in several articles, that her body was folded, and he put her in the garbage bin. It was also discovered later that there was garbage thrown in those bags along with Maddie. The tannery community simply could not believe this had happened. It's just horrible, and you feel bad for both families. Indeed, Maddie's family was devastated, not just shocked and deeply hurt, but confused. How could a 15-year-old boy even think of doing such a thing, let alone doing it? The police looked into his past, his family, his friends, anything that would give them a clue into his motivation. Apparently, he didn't really have any friends, just his yo-yo and his piano. There hadn't been any incidents reported from his school, but he did show cruelty to animals once, to his own dog. Many of these kids had one or two of those behaviors in their life. Killing animals, they're suicidal. They want to die. So that's a deadly combination. Indeed, Gonzalez had told some of his peers that he was thinking of ending himself just months before killing Maddie. This is what he wrote in one of his Instagram posts. Wears all black to try and look powerful and hide the crippling anxiety towards the future and the constant worry that I'll never find someone who loves me. Well, unfortunately, doing what he did, it is very likely he'll never find someone who loves him. Some of Gonzalez's schoolmates had seen this post and they always figured he was the lonely, depressive type, but they never imagined he was capable of doing such horrific things to another human being. I didn't really believe it at first. I still can't really picture him being the type of person to do that. Honestly, it's hard to picture anyone being that type of person. Who in any state of mind would do such a horrifying list of things to an eight-year-old? But Adrian Gonzalez was long gone. He described what he did to Maddie in full detail to the police with a calm face. He even used the word torturous about her death. Gonzalez was charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, assault, and several other crimes. The prosecutor the prosecution wanted to try him as an adult due to the brutality and premeditation of the crime. Yeah, one of the most egregious and shocking crimes in Santa Cruz County. Prosecutors said it's a crime that needs to be tried in adult court. Adrian Gonzalez described in court Tuesday as a deviant, homicidal, who showed no remorse or regret when he confessed to killing his eight-year-old neighbor. Gonzalez's defense attorneys looked into his motive behind the horrific murder. They found his crippling anxiety, depression, and suicide thoughts, along with his very low self-esteem, at the bottom of this. Gonzalez hated himself and wanted to die. He didn't have the courage to take his own life, so he took all his negative feelings onto a much more vulnerable person. The defense attorneys also argued that Gonzalez would need all the treatment and rehabilitation he can get, so he should spend his time at a juvenile facility. This would have meant that he would walk free at 23. How could we take that chance? of putting somebody back on the street in five years when he's 23 and say he's been treated, it's not right. But in 2017, when Gonzalez's trial started, Maddie's parents started speaking up for Maddie. They wanted justice for their daughter. I wanna make sure that if 
if he did this, that he's not able to do it again. During his trial, Gonzalez initially pleaded not guilty to all charges. Then he changed his mind and pleaded guilty. Adrian said that he had considered after he killed Maddie, a friend of his from middle school said that he would um, talk to her in the evenings and he was very depressed and he talked to her many times about killing himself or threatening to kill himself. Adrian Gonzalez told the judge that he killed Maddie to see how people would react if he took his own life. It was like a demo session. On Monday, July 28th, two days after killing Maddie, Gonzalez posted a video of his hands playing Gary Jules' song, Mad World, on piano. This was the soundtrack to the 2001 film, Donnie Darko, where the central character was defined by his death dreams. With most people speaking for trying Gonzalez as an adult, Laura joined the popular opinion. I do believe in giving young people, even adults who make mistakes, lots of rehabilitation, but on a case-by-case -case basis. One size does not fit all. He needs to be in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. To this day, Gonzalez has shown no remorse for his crimes. During the trial, Laura even asked him if he wanted to say something to her and he didn't reply. He never wrote an apology letter to Maddie's family or expressed any regrets. Adrian's mom, Reggie, however, is doing all she can to offer support and condolences to the family. She is devastated by her son's actions too and is trying to make amends in any way she can. Reggie said that both Laura and her lost children on July 26, 2015. The judge had agreed to try Gonzalez as an adult, but cases often drag in the US and it has taken years for the trial to actually reach a verdict. Unfortunately, in this case, the passing of time had a direct effect on Adrian Gonzalez's sentence. In August 2018, a new bill was passed. Senate Bill 1391, which modifies the law to prevent anyone under the age of 16 accused of violent crimes such as murder or serious felonies from automatically going to trial as an adult in the justice system. Gonzalez was already 19, but since he committed the murder when he was 15, he would now be automatically tried as a minor. He thus received a sentence of only six years in juvenile court to be released when he turns 25 years old. Gonzalez will serve out his sentence at the Department of Juvenile Justice until he's 25 years old. That's in four years. He will also need to register as a offender. The bill not only protected Gonzalez, but it can have bad repercussions on teenagers involved in gangs. Their families can push them to commit crimes for them, since the punishment for a 14 to 15 year old is much less severe than for an adult. Gonzalez's sentence was reduced to practically nothing because of this bill. Now he was facing approximately 127 years in adult court. But since this new ruling came down, this new law that says you cannot be tried as an adult if you're less than 16 years of age, he's now in juvenile court and they can only keep him until he's 25 years old. The law is the law, and Maddie's parents will have to make do with whatever justice they got for their daughter. Meanwhile, her father tries to build Maddie's legacy. I just keep feeling strongly that there's positive to come out of this. And I've seen it. I've seen it with people, how they interact, how they care more for each other. Um, how they take things less for granted. This is what we can hope for following such a horrible tragedy. The fear that Maddie experienced in her last moments is beyond heartbreaking. It makes no sense that things like this should happen to anyone, let alone a sweet, innocent girl. Unless we can learn something from tragedies like this, they were all for nothing. And that is the truly upsetting case of little Maddie Middleton. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Anna Solves. Before you go, why not give this video a like and subscribe? And if you can take it, why not check out our other disturbing cases? Have a good night, stay safe, and take care of each other. It's scary out there.